Amen. I just want to remind you, you have um, an outline in your bulletin. It'll be good to follow along. As you can see, there are a good number of principles about how to conquer temptation, so it'll be helpful for you if you're taking notes. Um, How can we conquer temptation? How can we conquer temptation? No matter who we are or where we're from, we will encounter temptations. Adam and Eve encountered temptation. We see David was tempted while he was walking on the roof of his, his house. Israel was tempted in the wilderness towards bitterness and to turn away from God and sexual morality. Christ was tempted. You can be sure you will be tempted as well. I think it's implied in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there's no temptation taking you but that which is common to man. Um, but God is faithful that he'll not let you be tempted beyond what you are able. And with the temptation, he'll provide a way of escape. We'll be tempted. But the temptation, God is going to give you grace to either endure it. Sometimes you have to go just be faithful in a situation that's difficult where there's various things around you. Sometimes you just have to endure it. Sometimes by God's grace, he removes it. And so if we're all going to be tempted, the question really is, how will we respond? How will we respond when we encounter temptation in the midst of our worship now or when we leave the congregation? How will we respond to the various temptations in this text? We see Joseph imprisoned in Egypt. You remember the story before in Genesis 37. We see his brothers were jealous of him. He was the favored son, and therefore he was taken and sold into slavery. He gets taken to Egypt, and he's picked up by a man named Potiphar. While he's in the house as a slave, yes, he's tempted by the wife, but Joseph encounters many temptations. He's tempted to be upset. And bitter about his circumstances. His family betrayed him. Certainly that was a very difficult temptation he had to overcome while being in Potiphar's house. When he gets successful, he's tempted to be independent of God. To be prideful and to be independent from God. Obviously he's tempted with sexual temptation by the wife. When he gets put in prison, no doubt he's tempted again to despondency, to discouragement, to depression. Joseph encountered a lot of temptations in this text. Unlike Genesis 37, where we learn from the family's failure, in this text, we learn from Joseph's success. If we're all going to encounter temptation, probably while you're sitting here worshiping today or when you leave automatically, how can we conquer it? How can we respond in a way that's successful um, when we encounter temptation? We're going to look at Eight different principles as we go through this text. I think it's full of wise wisdom, wise wisdom, wise principles that we can apply to our life. Here's the first one. To conquer temptation, we must submit to God's discipline instead of becoming bitter at it. We must submit to God's discipline instead of becoming bitter at it. When Joseph is taken into the house of Potiphar, first of all, Potiphar's name means devoted to the sun. As you know, Egyptians worship the god Ra. He comes from a a pagan religious background, just like many of you may be named Daniel or Joseph, or we call our daughter Saya after Messiah, anointed one. Many of you may come from a household where they gave you some type of Christian name or something that represented your background of someone who worshiped God. He came from a pagan background. Probably his family worshiped Ra, the sun god. We also see here that he is captain of Pharaoh's bodyguard. Historical records tell us this, that the bodyguards of Pharaoh were actually his executioners. When Pharaoh didn't like somebody, they would go off and execute them. This means Pharaoh was, excuse me, Potiphar was the chief executioner, right? He probably had a long decorated military background. And in the military, we have guys that are what we call colonels or generals. They've been in the military for 20 or 30 years. They're rugged. They're, they're salty. They got, they've got a great sense of humor, but they've got a rough edge on them. He probably was a difficult guy to be around. He was the chief of the bodyguards, chief executioner. When, when Joseph was probably put into the household working for this guy, it probably was a little bit intimidating being around this guy named Potiphar with a decorated military resume. However, in this text, We don't see this in the English, but in the Hebrew, it's very apparent. The word Yahweh is mentioned, I believe, eight times. The word Yahweh is mentioned eight times. The rest of Genesis, Yahweh is only mentioned one time. This means 
that while Joseph is in this terrible situation, God is present. He's present with Joseph while he's in, in Potiphar's household as a slave. He prospers the things that he does. In fact, so much so, it says that Potiphar could see Yahweh was with him. Joseph is being a light while he's serving in this man's household. And even Potiphar can tell there's something different about this guy. And so he makes him the personal attendant. And then he makes him the overseer of all his household. One of the things that we can discern while Joseph was in the the prison cell, I believe there's a principle about conquering temptation. I believe we can tell that Joseph was not bitter, was not despondent, was not depressed. How can we tell that? I think we can tell at least by two ways. One, if he was a bitter, complaining guy, he never would have been promoted. You don't promote the guy that's gossiping. You don't promote the guy that's got a bad attitude. You don't promote the guy that's, you know, just just has a, a negative attitude. They hurt the workplace. They lower productivity. This man must have had a good attitude while I was working for him. Here's the second way we can tell that Joseph didn't fall into the temptation of bitterness and complaining. God blesses him. God blesses him. One of the things that we can discern from Scripture is that when we go through trials and tribulations, again, we're tempted to be bitter, complain, get mad at God, get mad at others, separate from God, separate from others because we're angry. But that because of that, God actually disciplines us. That's what happened with Israel in the wilderness. Listen to what 1 Corinthians 10, 9 through 10 says in warning us about complaining when we go through trials. He says, we must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did, referring to Israel, and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. This means if Joseph had failed at this temptation, become the bitter person at the workplace, becoming the complaining person, what would have happened? God would have disciplined him instead of blessing him. We see here that Joseph submits to God's discipline instead of becoming the bitter, complaining guy that affects productivity, lowers productivity, that that spreads this bitterness around the workplace or the household. He passes the test, conquers temptation in part, by submitting to God's discipline. Again, this is where many of us simply fail. When we go through hard times with family, work, school, relationships, we become bitter, we complain, Instead of praising God and seeing him in control of our trials, sometimes we get mad at God. Or we act like he's not in control, like he doesn't know what he's doing best. Many commonly hold anger or bitterness for years because of some traumatic event like Joseph, the family situation. That was going to be hard to get over. His brothers that he was raised with and had fun with who had betrayed him. This would have been very difficult for Joseph to get over. Many hold bitterness for many years. They're angry at their parents. They're angry at the school system. They're angry at government. Angry at some who harmed them. Or sometimes even just angry at God. And instead of receiving God's blessings, they actually receive more of God's discipline. That's what uh, Paul warned us about. That's what the narrative in the Exodus is warning us against. No doubt one of the reasons that Joseph could have be faithful in the midst of this temptation to complaining and bitterness is because he had a vision before he went into slavery, right? Genesis chapter 37, verses 5 through 11. We see Joseph has a vision of his parents bowing down to him and his brothers bowing down to him. He, God had already told him many years, I don't know how long it's been, had already told him shortly before that I am going to work things out for your good. I am gonna, I'm going to use events for your good in your life. Joseph had a promise. Let me tell you something. You have a clearer promise. You may not have dreams, but you have an even clearer promise than Joseph did. Right? Joseph could have maybe chalked it up. Maybe I ate something bad at night. You know, maybe I just had a, you know, just had a weird dream. He had a lot of reasons he could have doubted that. But you have clear promises in the scripture. Romans 8, 28. God is working all things to the good of those who love the Lord. James chapter 1, is it verse 4? James 1, 2, verse 4. James 1, 4. Let perseverance have her perfect work, that you may be entire and complete, lacking nothing. Right? You already have a very clear promise, no matter how difficult your situation is, that this is being used for your good. And you know the story. If he had never been in Potiphar's house, he would have never been put in prison. If he had never been put in prison, he never can been, a, been exalted as second in command. Joseph knew this by faith. 
and he inherited the promises by faith and patience as he waits. We also have a very clear word in Hebrews 12, verse 5 through 7, and then verse 11. My son, do not scorn, don't get angry at the Lord's discipline, or give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son he accepts. Endure hardship. Listen what the writer of Hebrews says. He doesn't qualify hardship. He doesn't say the hardship came from, from man or the hardship came from the devil. He says, he just gives it a general term, all hardship. Endure hardship as God's discipline. He's treating you as sons. God is over Satan when he brings trials to you. He's over the evil people at your job that, or the stinky roommate, whatever trial you may have. He's sovereign over that. In fact, he goes on in verse 11. No discipline seemed pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Those who are trained by their hardship, by their, their difficulty, it creates more righteousness, more love, more peace in your circumstance, regardless of what you go through, right? Now, this was... A tremendous training season for Joseph. He learns humility. He was no longer the favored son with the pretty robe. He was a slave. He learns humility. He learns administration skills. As he starts to oversee Potiphar's household, this was preparing him for one day overseeing the kingdom. He was being trained. He learns language. You can imagine how difficult this season was, how bitter. He, he doesn't understand what anybody's saying. He doesn't, he doesn't, the culture is totally different. They have different culture than the Hebrew culture. This was major culture shock. This was a hard situation. But he was being trained. He picks up the customs. He picks up the language while he's there. God is preparing him through this season of discipline. It's a boot camp meant to make him strong, preparing him for what's next. To the congregation struggling with persecution, scattered across Asia Minor, 1 Peter 5, 6-7 says this. 1 Peter 5, 6-7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Humble yourself in the midst of your persecution from evil men and the devil. Humble yourself under God's mighty hand. He's going to lift you up. That's what we see happening with Joseph. God lifts him up as he humbles himself under God's mighty hand. One of the ways you can tell if you're submitting to God's discipline or you're, you're sca- chafing at it, scorning at it, is by your attitude. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, give thanks in all circumstances, even the bad ones, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Give thanks in all circumstances. How are you responding? One of the ways you're going to conquer temptation is you're going to submit to God's discipline instead of becoming bitter at it. You start to see God in control of all of it, even over Satan, like we see with Job. Job simply says, the Lord gives and he takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He views hardship as under the sovereignty of God, even when Satan was doing it, because God is over Satan. God is over evil men that went and stole his goods. Job passed Because he saw God in control. He submitted to God's discipline instead of becoming bitter at it. How are you responding to the discipline that you're going through? How are you responding to the hardship or the temptation that you're going through? You must see God in control and submit to him. Here's a second principle about conquering temptation. We must practice integrity in all areas of life. We must practice integrity in all areas of life. In verses 4 through 6... We see that Joseph is appointed over everything in Potter's household. If you read through this again, you'll see it's mentioned four times, right? Back then, they didn't have the exclamation mark in the Hebrew language or in the Greek language. So when they emphasized something, what did they do? They repeated it. Every, he was over everything Potiphar owned. Potiphar didn't give a thought to anything except for the food he ate, right? So this tells us that Joseph was trustworthy in the, very, the, the things that God had given him. Now, this is important. Because if Joseph had been cheating in the business matters, stealing money from Potiphar, or lying about certain things under his care, when Miss Potiphar came to tempt him, it's very likely he'd have been more prone to fall to this bigger temptation. This is a principle that we see even taught in the New Testament. Luke chapter 16, verse 10. It says this, The one who is faithful in very little will be faithful in much. 
And the one who is dishonest in very little will be dishonest in much. If Joseph was being unfaithful in the little that God had already given him as he was overseeing Potiphar's household, then he'd be more likely to be unfaithful with much when the bigger temptation comes. Or when he gets to Egypt and he's around pagan idolatry and sexual immorality, all that's happening in the leadership of, of uh, Egypt, he would have been more prone to fall if he wasn't being, having, showing integrity in all the areas of life. This is how a lot of Christians, um, a lot of Christians compartmentalize their life and their mor- morality. Let me show you how. They say certain deceptions are okay and some are not. For instance, it's okay to cheat on a test because everybody else is doing it, right? Or it's okay to illegally download that costs too much anyway. Right? I don't want to pay that money. It's okay to illegally download. They say it's okay to cheat on taxes. The government is taking too much of my money, and they don't deserve it. But what they are doing is by being dishonest in their little, what they're doing is preparing for future failure and bigger temptations. It happens all the time. What you start to do is you start to harden your conscience that certain things are okay, and then all of a sudden you fall when the bigger things come along. See, Joseph... The narrator wants us to see four times in in four, five, six, three verses that he was overall, he was trustworthy in everything. His integrity, Joseph's integrity was preparing him for future exaltation, to be second in command. If he was faithful over Potter's house and with Potter's wife, he was going to be able to be faithful with bigger temptations in Egypt. If you're being unfaithful in little, guess what? You're preparing yourself to be unfaithful in much. That's what scripture says. It's a biblical principle, right? Um, Are you being uh, being faithful in all areas of your life? Or are you compartmentalizing, like a lot of Christians, preparing yourself for a bigger failure, maybe in marriage or something else? Because you're allowing yourself to have little areas of compromise in your life. Here's the third principle. To conquer temptation... We must especially guard ourselves in times of success. We must especially guard ourselves in times of success. If you look at verses 6 through 7, it says Joseph was well built and good looking. Amen. Right? That's a great thing to have about you said in the Bible, right? Soon after these things, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, "Um, come and lie with me or have sex with me. There's only four guys in the Bible where it's said that they're good looking, right? There's Joseph, there's Saul, there's David, there's Solomon. Four guys. But even though he was good looking, and that's no doubt part of the reason Potiphar's wife likes him, it says this, after these things, um, soon after these things, his master's wife took notice of him. Guess what? It wasn't until Joseph was exalted. When he was a good looking slave, she didn't notice him. But when he was good looking and he was over everything, all of a sudden, Potiphar's wife was attracted to him and made a move on him. Here's the reality. The more we become successful in life, the more temptations we will often encounter. This is what Thomas Carlyle, a Scottish historian, said. Adversity is hard on a man. But for one man who can stand prosperity... There are a hundred that can stand adversity. It's easier to stand in adversity than it is to stand when things are good. That's another temptation. Listen to what Chuck Swindoll said. Few people can live in the lap of luxury and maintain their spiritual, emotional, and moral equilibrium. Sudden elevation often disturbs balance, which leads to pride, a sense of self-sufficiency, and then a fall. It's ironic But more of us can hang tough through a demotion than through a promotion. And it's at this level that a godly leader shows himself or herself strong. The right kind of leaders, when promoted, know how to handle a promotion. Promotion offers more doors for temptation. For instance, when you become more more successful, you have less people looking over your shoulders, checking on you to make sure you do things right. When you get promoted, you start to have, become successful, you have more freedoms and perks. And then with them, there are temptations to abuse your freedoms and your perks. Uh, Freedoms, temptation to abuse the new authority that you have. How commonly do we see successful pastors, athletes, businessmen, government, government officials fall? 
with success comes more temptation, often coming from even the opposite sex. When Saul was successful, he fell. When David was successful, he fell. When Solomon was successful, he fell. Unfortunately, sudden, fa sudden falls, when success comes, is very common. You see people getting authority and they lose their mind. Right? Like, what in the heck is happening? When you're successful, when God promotes you, you're going to have to institute more disciplines in your life. For instance, you're going to need greater accountability. More people that you invite, because when you're at the top, no one can speak to you many times. You need to invite more people into your life to speak into you, to challenge you about the ways that you're going. You need greater accountability when God promotes you. You need to be more transparent, having times of confession and sharing what's going on. You need to be more disciplined with your time and money, because there's a temptation to abuse your money. Here's another one. We need to guard our families more when you become successful. Because when you're successful, more people are like, come lead this, get on this committee, do this, do that. And what can happen is it starts to choke out time with your wife, with your husband, with your children. And then all of a sudden you start to have problems in your family. You need to learn how to say no. It's a holy word in Christianity. Everybody say this with me. No. No, I'm not joining your club. No. Right? You need to learn how to say no because... It can hurt your family later on. Something you have to learn now, otherwise it's going to hurt you later on in life, especially when God promotes you and gives you favor. To conquer temptation, we must especially guard ourselves in times of temptation. Here's the next one. To conquer temptation, we must seriously consider the consequences. We must seriously consider the consequences. In verse 8 through 9, it says, Joseph refused when she asked to sleep with him. He says, look, my master does not give any thought to his household with me here, and everything he owns he has put into my care. There's no one greater in his household than I am. He has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. So how could I do such a great evil and sin against God? Joseph mentions two issues. One, I'd be hurting my master. Two, I'd be hurting my God. One of the things we must do when we're tempted is seriously consider the conse consequences. Sin drastically affects us, but it also affects others. Listen to what Solomon says to his son about avoiding the adulterous woman or the, pro the, 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 the prostitute. He says this in Proverbs 6, 27 through 29, and then in verse 32 through 33. He says, son, can a man hold fire against his chest without burning his clothes? No. Can a man walk on hot coals without scorching his feet? No. So it is with the one who has sex with his neighbor's wife. No one who touches her will escape punishment. He says to his son, a man who commits adultery with a woman lacks wisdom. Whoever does it will destroy his own life. He'll be beaten and despised. His reproach will not be wiped away. He says, son, I want you to think deeply about this. The reproach will last forever. The consequences will last forever if you go this way. Son, think deeply about this. In the same way, you must consider your consequences. Um, Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Guess what? Any one of your temptations, even for little things like illegally downloading, the, the, the purpose of Satan's temptation is not for you to sin. He ultimately wants to get you to the place where he can destroy you. Steal, kill, and destroy. It's not about doing something that's small or small compromise to you. He wants to get you where you keep compromising, where he can destroy you. And you have to think further ahead along the, the line so that you'll stay away from any types of compromise in your life by seeing the dangerous consequences. We should consider how it'll affect ourselves, our friends, our family, other Christians, non-believers. If I'm compromising in the classroom, if I'm compromising my language, how will it affect non-believers who are looking at me to try to discern something about my master? For myself, I'll be fully honest, when I'm, when I'm dealing with temptation, I think about my daughter. I could, I could destroy my daughter's life where she would be dealing with the consequences of my sin for the rest of her life. I think about that. I think about how it could devastate my wife, how I could put her through it. I think about how if I had some major spiritual failure, that many people in my congregation at HIC would never return to church. Some of you may even turn away from Christ altogether. One of the things you must do 
if you're going to keep yourself from temptation, is you must seriously think about the consequences, how it could affect you, affect others. Spurgeon said this as he thought about God. Joseph realized it would hurt, the, hurt, hurt Potiphar, but it also, more importantly, would hurt God because all sin is a sin against God. Listen to what Charles Spurgeon said about this. When I regarded God as a tyrant, I thought sin a trifle, just a little thing to go and do sins. But when I knew him to be my father, then I mourned that I could ever kick against him. When I thought that God was hard, I found it easy to sin. When I found God so kind, so good, and so overflowing with compassion, I smote upon my breast to think that I could ever rebel against one who loved me so and sought my good. How could I sin against someone so good to me? For many of us, the less that we know God, the easier it is to sin against him. But let me tell you, the more you get to know the goodness of God, the harder it will be to sin because you realize you hurt God, you grieve him, but also you miss his blessing. You miss his grace over your life. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 12 says this. Titus 2, 11 through 12. For the grace of God, meaning the unmerited favor of God, has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. It trains us to reject godless ways and worldly desires, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. The more we experience God's grace, it's training us. The goodness of God brings men to repentance, right? Joseph considered the consequences, including how it would affect God. Are you thinking about, seriously, about the consequences? When you sin, it just makes it easier to sin again, and to sin again, and to sin again. And then all of a sudden, you open up more doors of sin. Satan's, uh, Satan's really leading to, he wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy your calling. He wants to destroy the dream, the things that God has put in your heart. He wants to keep you away from those things. No doubt, God, Satan is trying to do that with Joseph even now. He wants to hinder the promises of God on Joseph's life. And Satan wants to do that with you as well. You must think deeply about the consequences of moral failure. Here's the next one. To conquer temptation... We must recognize how evil sin is. We must recognize how evil sin is. Again, Genesis 39b. So how could I do such a great evil and sin against God? Now, in the pagan world, adultery was normal. It was common for men to have mistresses um, or sometimes concubines. Um, especially the more successful you were, the more money you had. Even Abraham, Jacob had concubines. And what would happen in that pagan culture was many times the wife was lonely. Let me add this in here. In the pagan world, marriage was not about monogamy, and it wasn't even about love. It was about prestige. You look, sometimes we see that even in our culture today. When you marry, you find someone who has a good job, who comes from a good family, who's going to make a lot of money so that you can move up the social ladder. But it wasn't about love. It wasn't about monogamy. Mistresses and concubines were for that. So many times the wife was alone. And some wives felt tempted to go and find love outside the marriage. Now when Joseph says this would be a great evil, Potiphar's wife probably says, what? It's not that big of a deal. Potiphar probably has many wives. I'm here lonely. You're a good-looking man. I'm a good, older-looking woman. It's going to be fun. It's going to be great, right? This is going to be enjoyable. And so for her, she would try to probably de de minimize how bad it was. This is exactly how the world and Satan promote sin to us. It's not great evil. Promiscuity is natural. It's a natural desire. You got to sleep, don't you? You got to eat. You got to have some type of relationship. This is absolutely normal. Why would you forbid yourself sleeping, eating, and sex? These are normal things that we need, right? They would say. It's not normal to forbid yourself. Homosexuality is not a sin. It's an alternative lifestyle. It's just a different lifestyle. Why are you so archaic? Why are you so archaic? Getting angry is just self-expression. If you don't let it out, even let it out against God, you're denying who you are. All that matters is that you be who you are. Express yourself. Let it out. But Christ said to be angry is morally equivalent to murder in Matthew 5. Sometimes they'll even lower it and say it's a disease. Look, 
You getting drunk and abusing your wife, it's not your fault. You have a disease. You see the movies. It's not your fault. You're sick, man. Don't beat yourself up. You're sick. It's a disease, right? And so they lower it by saying it's a disease. You couldn't help yourself, right, because you're sick. It's not, your, it's not somebody's fault if they have cancer, right? It's not, it's not your fault that you got drunk and beat your wife, right? Satan is the ultimate businessman. He simply rebrands sin, gives it a different name to make people feel more comfortable with it and make people accept it more. And so many people never can conquer sin in their life because to them it's not that bad. Everybody else is doing it. It's not a big deal, right? They even think about it. Someone has a fling or a fair. It sounds kind of mysterious and cool. I want to have a fling and a fair. It sounds kind of tight, right? It doesn't sound like something like a great evil. It's rebranded. Just maybe, since I'm being so serious, maybe I shouldn't share a joke. But <laughs> when we were in the States, we, uh, we, live in, we live around Austin, Texas. When we go visit my brother in Dallas. And in the midst of going from Austin to Dallas, you have to drive through a place called Waco, where, they, where Baylor University is. In fact, I met up with one of our Handong's grad students at Baylor and just had food with him and ate with him. But there's this one um, burger shop. It's a burger, fries, and uh, smoothie place, it's a shake place. And the name of it is Healthy Camp. Right? And so we go to this, every time we drive, we see all these signs for he Healthy Camp. We're like, it's a burger and shake place. I said, we got to go check this out. <laughs> so we go and eat, and I'm like, man, I'm eating this burger. I was like, this even feels healthy. Right? It's kind of like the, the, I was like, this is great marketing. I even feel, they did say it was like 100% Angus burger or something like that, but there's still grease and grease all over the fries. It's still a shake. But it made me feel really good about eating it, right? Because they said it was healthy. And I was like, oh, healthy camp, right? That's what Satan does with us. He rebrands it. And all of a sudden, our conscience is seared, and we don't feel that bad about what we're doing anymore, right? Many people can't get free from sin simply because it's not that heinous to them. They don't hate it enough, and therefore they're not going to get rid of it. Here's the next way we conquer temptation. To conquer temptation, we must avoid it persistently. We must avoid it persistently. In verse 10 through 12, even though she continued to speak to Joseph day after day, he did not respond to her invitation to have sex with her. One day he went into the house to do his work. One of the, one of the, when none of the household servants were there in the house, she grabbed him by his outer garment, saying, have sex with me. But he left his outer garment in her hand and ran outside. Um, it says she spoke to him day after day, tempting him. She probably just didn't speak. She's probably wise. She probably wore re very revealing garments to make sure Joseph saw her. She probably had on a lot of very alluring perfume that even if Joseph was working, he could smell it, you know, smell the perfume. Um, the NIV actually translates verse 10 this way. He refused to go to bed with her and even be with her, meaning that what Joseph did was he started to avoid her. He smelled the perfume and he'd go the other direction. He saw her in the house. He was like, oh, no. No, he would hear her speak and he would get out of the way. In fact, when she grabs him, he just jumps out the, you know, he's had these reflexes. He's been hiding her so long. He's like, oh, you got me. He jumps out the, the, the window. He would have been avoiding her. Uh, in order to not succumb to temptation. Similarly, if we are going to conquer temptation, we must avoid it persistently as well. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 says, Stay away from every form of evil. That includes the TV shows you watch, which most Christians don't do because they think they're so strong, right? It, it, stay away from every, abstain from every type of evil, evil. Christ taught that if your eye offends you, what you look at, you should pluck out your eye. If your hand offends you, what you're doing, you should cut off your arm. And if your feet offend you, where you've been going, you should cut off your feet. It's better to enter into heaven lame with one arm than it is to enter into hell with two arms. He says you've got to be drastic. You've got to be drastic, even willing to jump out the window to be holy. This is the very reason that many people can never conquer temptation. Um, we're called to flee from it just like Joseph. Ken Hughes, a, pa a pastor that used to be at Wheaton, uh, used to pastor a church in Wheaton, Illinois, he said this. He says, the word is out. God is looking for a few good cowards. The word is out. God is looking for a few good cowards. The rest of scripture supports this. 2 Timothy 2.22, flee the evil desires of youth. 1 Corinthians 6.18, 
flee sexual immorality. The problem with many Christians, why they can't conquer temptation, they're too strong. They boast about, oh, I can watch that and it doesn't affect me. I can do this and it doesn't affect me. They're too strong to ever have total victory or consistent victory, rather, over temptation. They're too strong and therefore they allow certain things in their life persistently instead of running, cutting off, turning off the Wi-Fi in the house, getting rid of the TV, whatever it takes, they're too strong. And therefore, they continue to stumble and fall. If we're going to conquer temptation, we must avoid it persistently as well. Here's the next one. To conquer temptation, we must be willing to pay the cost. To conquer temptation, we must be willing to pay the cost. We see in verses 13 through 20 that after Miss Potiphar grabs a hold of his jacket or garment or robe, that she takes it, she, she's, she's a woman that's not used to not getting her way. She probably nags Mr. Potiphar all the time and gets her away. She's not used to not getting her way. And so she's so enraged that she frames Joseph. In fact, she calls all the servants and says, the Hebrew Potiphar brought, he said, he's going to, he came here to, to shame us. Basically, she feeds on their ethnic pride, their sense of fear of stranger, racism, essentially. He says, look. Be careful of the Hebrew. He came to shame me. And then she grabs, uh, grabs Potiphar and essentially blames, you, blames him. The Hebrew you brought here came in here to shame me. And as you know, Joseph is thrown into prison because of that. Um, let me stop here. There, there's some evidence, I think strong evidence in this text. The question would be, did Potiphar really believe his wife? Did Potiphar really believe his wife that Joseph came to rape her. There's circumstantial evidence. You lawyers, you can look through this text, and try, this text and try to break it down. There's a lot of circumstantial evidence that proves, I think, that he did not believe his wife. Let me, let me give you some of that really quick, and then we'll jump back to the point. First of all, when it says he's furious in verse 19, it never says he's furious at Joseph. It's not, that's not very clear. Secondly, the normal consequence of adultery is what? Death. And so the chief... Uh, executioner gives him a lenient sentence, put him in prison. So we see a lenient sentence. That's one of the circumstantial evidences. Third one. If you go to Genesis 40, verses 2 through 3, it says this. Pharaoh was enraged with his two officials, the cupbearer and the baker. So he imprisoned them in the house of the captain of the guard, Potiphar, in the same facility where Joseph was fine. If Pot, if Joseph had really tried to sleep with his wife, you'd think that Potiphar would send him away. So I not, not want to see this guy again, but he puts him, keeps him in the house, in the prison in his house. So that's kind of strange. Here's the strongest evidence, circumstantial evidence. In Genesis 44, we see that Potiphar, the captain of the guard, entrusts Joseph with caring for the cupbearer and the baker. Right? Listen to what Genesis 44 says. The captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be their attendant, and he served them. Now, that just doesn't make any sense, right? Because if Joseph had failed him in the utmost form of trust, trying to rape his wife, how could he entrust him with taking care of the Pharaoh's prisoners, right? That doesn't make sense. He's untrustworthy. He's broken the ultimate form of trust. That doesn't seem to make sense. Not only that, we also see, even though Potiphar is over the warden, Joseph's also overseeing all the prisoners. He gets all this authority. It doesn't seem to be that Potiphar really believes his wife. I think that this is more like Daniel chapter 6. When Daniel gets thrown into prison, if you remember the story, the administrators got, got in such a way where Daniel uh, broke the law, um, and the, the, the Persian king had to throw him in prison, but he knew that, Joseph, that Daniel had been set up. He believed him. He says, your God will protect you as he puts him in prison. It seems like Potiphar was put in a situation where he had to punish Joseph. He didn't give him the ultimate penalty. It would have been a tremendous loss of face in his household. The wife had told everybody about it. It had been tremendously hard with his wife. And so it seems like uh, Potiphar is saving face. Either way, that's just some tidbits that's going to make sense when you get to Genesis 40. Either way, what we see that Joseph was willing to pay the cost. It, he probably already knew. That if, he, it, it, that if he had chosen not to give in to this powerful woman in the house, there would be possibly consequences. And he knew it, and he was willing to pay the cost. Listen, there are many people that con conquer sin, 
simply because they don't want to offend or lose someone who's tempting them. Maybe it's a girlfriend or boyfriend. Or maybe it's some friends that are taking them. They're not willing to pay the cost to be holy. Some don't want to be, get skipped over promotion. And so when people are going out to the clubs to drink after work, they feel like they can't say no because it may hurt their job, right? And so many people can't conquer temptation because they're not willing to pay the cost. Sometimes we may even have to pay the cost of our life. <laughs> Joseph is dealing with the chief executioner here. Sometimes the cost may even be our life. What type of price? Sometimes the price may be loneliness, being made fun of, losing one's job, or even losing one's life. There's a cost to being holy, and we have to be willing to pay it. Sometimes it means failing a test instead of cheating on the test. We have to be willing to pay the cost. Here's the last one. To conquer temptation, we must trust that God's plans are better. We must trust that God's plans are better. While Joseph is in prison, we see in verses 21 through 23, God shows him great kindness. Again, just like the beginning of the chapter, God was with him. And God gave him favor uh, with the warden. And God sets him, essentially he ends up being set over all the prisoners, caring for them. Special privileges while he's in the prison. And as we know later on, if he had never been put in prison, that this was part of God's strategy. Yes, Satan was trying to lie and deceive him and get him trapped, but God was in control of it. This was going to open the door for Pharaoh one day for him to interpret Pharaoh's dream and him one day being made to second command. Joseph had to trust that God's plans were better, that the promise that he had received in the dream was of God and keeping his integrity was good. See, listen to this. When Satan tempts you, when Satan tempts you, he always tries to make you think, that it's going to be good, or that God's will is not the best. Remember with Eve in the garden? God's lying. If you eat of this tree, you'll be just like him. He wants us to doubt that God's plans are better, which enabled Eve to sin. She stopped believing that God's plans were good. She started doubting God. And so it was easy for her to give in to sin. In the same way, Satan does the same thing with, that, with us. Getting drunk will be lots of fun. And guess what? You won't hurt anybody, including yourself. Getting drunk will be lots of fun. It won't hurt anybody. He says sex out of marriage will make you closer to your mate. It'll make you closer to you, even though all studies say that those who are promiscuous before marriage have lower marriage outcomes, less joy in marriage, less joy in the sex life. He lies to you and says it's going to make you closer. It's better for you. He says how are you going to marry a person if you've never tried it out? You've never lived with them. Live with them. Try it out. See if it works. All studies say when you live with, when you live with the person before you're married, that it, it lowers how long you're going to stay married. Right? He lies. And many people, because they doubt God's will, doubt that God's plans are good for them, doubt that God has, that he's only given you laws that are meant to help you, they doubt God's plans, and therefore they fall to temptation. Joseph had to trust that keeping his integrity, doing God's will, was to the best, even if it meant some consequences. Ultimately, even if the, the blessing comes in heaven, even if as great as your reward in heaven because you were persecuted for righteousness, Matthew 5.11, even if it's just that, it's worth it. It's worth it. If you don't tr trust that God's plans are good, and that somehow he's working your circumstances out for your good, just like he did with Joseph, him being in a difficult situation in prison, which is going to lead to him being in second in command. If you don't trust that God's ways are mysterious and unpredictable, but they're always good and best, then you will fall to temptation because you will believe the lie of Satan. How can we conquer temptation? I want to invite EPT up here. We learn a great deal from Joseph's triumphant example. We must submit to God's discipline instead of becoming bitter at it. We must practice integrity in all areas of life. When you're unfaithful with little, it's going to lead to you being unfaithful with much. That's how life works. You've got to be aware of it. Your little compromises are preparing you for a bigger compromise. We must guard ourselves in times of success. The more faithful you are to God, the more disciplined you are with your life, you will typically find that God opens up doors for you. But those doors typically come with more temptations. And you'll need to be even more disciplined than you were beforehand. We must seriously consider the consequences. How will it affect me, my, my family, my friends, unbelievers, other Christians? 
You must recognize how evil sin really is. It'll be a great evil, Joseph said. You must avoid it persistently. You've got to be a good coward, not someone who thinks that they're strong because you're really weak. Like Peter saying, everybody else will deny you, but not me. Peter was too strong. It led to him falling. Christ was giving him a way of escape, right? I'm telling you you're going to sin. Now go pray for an hour so that you don't sin. He was too strong, too strong. He thought he was too strong, and therefore he neglected his disciplines and ultimately failed. To conquer t- uh, temptation, we must be willing to pay the cost. We must trust that God's plans are better for us. Each one of us, there's not one person in here right now that Satan, in the same way that God has plans for us, Satan has plans for you as well. His plans are to deceive you. There are lies about your future that Satan's been telling many of us. There are lies about your present, lies about your current situation um, that many of us adopt and we get bitter, we become complaining. There are lies about what we enjoy and Satan is leading us, leading us into certain sins that are going to keep us away from God's best and his blessing. Right now, if we could just pray that God would remove the blinders from every eye, that we see very clearly the lies that's been spoken in our lives, that's taken away our joy, the lies that's kept us frustrated and discouraged, that's kept us addicted in a habitual sin. If we just could pray that God would expose the lies, that even during this time, that each person here would hear God's truth, specifically for that temptation. You're perfectly and wonderfully made. No matter what anybody says about you, you've got talents and gifts I want to use for my kingdom and my purpose. Your circumstances may be difficult, but I'm training you. You may not see it. I have things that you're going to have to stand in. I'm training you. Whatever God needs to speak into their lives, if you could pray right now that God would speak very clearly to us individually, he speak very clearly to each one of us corporately, that we know he has good plans for us. And knowing the goodness of God, the grace of God, would help us turn away from sin, shun whatever doors are leading us to sin. Pray for it to be exposed. Pray for God to impart truth. Let's pray for that for one another right now. Luke 4, we see that when Christ was tempted in the wilderness, as he was faithful in it, the angels came and strengthened him, that he left filled in the power of the Spirit, and his ministry began in a powerful way. In the same way, we see that as Joseph was faithful in temptation, God was with him and empowered him, and he was successful. Let's pray right now that God would be with us as we choose his path instead of the enemy's path. And we would experience special manifestations of God. That he'd anoint us in our studies. He'd anoint us in our work. He'd anoint us as we serve our families and we're with our friends. And that others would see Christ through us as we choose his narrow path instead of the broad path that everybody else is on. That God's presence would be there and he would glorify himself. Everyone could see that God is there. Pray for that right now. For a special manifestation of God's presence in the life of each one of us anointing us to do the things or persevere through the things that we're going through in our lives. Just pray for that right now.
only pray this for our church. Let's pray this for our university. That we would be faithful with, through whatever trials that God and his sovereignty allows. That we would hold on to him and trust his words. That we would not neglect the truths of scripture. We would not turn away into liberalism, but hold fast to his truths. And as we're faithful to God, that God would bless this place. That he'd raise up students and faculty and staff that are going to go throughout the world and be a blessing to the nations. As Joseph is being a blessing to the nations here in Egypt. And as he goes, it is exalted Egypt. Pray that God would bless our students and faculty. Pray for your own family members. Pray for your friends. Let's lift up others right now and pray for grace to conquer temptation. If there's certain sins you know that they're struggling, pray for it to be broken in Jesus' name and victory in their lives. Let's cry out for that. shoulder of someone next to you, if you could just pray right now that God's love would be their foundation, that they would not be sh shaken, that they would not be shaken by events in their life, that they would not stumble when tempted, and if they stumble, that the foundation of God's love would pick them up, would dust them off, would cleanse their conscience, would strengthen them to walk. If you could pray that they would know the depth, the height, and the width of God's love for them that they may be filled to the fullness of God, empowered by him to walk and stand against temptation, empowered by him to serve others and bless others, empowered by him to be a deliverer as Joseph would be. If you could pray that they would know God's love and experience the blessings that come from that. Let's pray for the people around us really quick. confess that on our own we can't stand that on our own we're weak that apart from your grace apart from your love we're vulnerable and so we thank you lord that you're with us we thank you lord that you've given us your word we thank you lord that you've given us your spirit and we thank you lord that you surrounded us with wonderful brothers and sisters and spiritual mothers and fathers who care for us 
we ask that you'd help us to stand and bring glory to your name. Help our university to stand. We ask that you strengthen the church in Korea to stand and the church in the nations around the world, that they may glorify you and that the Potiphar's may see God in them. We love you, Lord. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Father. Amen. Have a wonderful Lord's Day. God bless you.